We come now to the final section in handout theology, section 11, eschatology, or the doctrine of things to come. Chapter 98, Millennialisms. In this chapter, I just want to try to indicate the varieties that we have and particularly to show what we have in common. I think when we come to these more advanced lectures later on in the next 50, perhaps we will go into more detail at this area, but I think it's good for us in any discussion of millennium in which there is considerable difference and quite a bit of debate and much of it rather overly severe to realize that there is a great deal in common by the different views concerning the millennium. Number one, before noticing the difference, let us see what the three classical Christian millennial views are and what they have in common. Number two, all Christians believe in a millennium, an ideal 1,000-year period which is or will yet be immediately before or after the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is full of predictions of a time of future earthly glory. Righteousness will cover the earth as waters cover the sea, Isaiah 11:9. The wolf and lion will lie down together while infants play with poisonous snakes and nations beat swords into plowshares. Isaiah 11, 6, 65, 25, Micah 4, 3, etc. Now, the word millennium, which means, as a Latin term, a thousand years, actually only occurs once in the whole Bible, and that's in Revelation 20. But the idea of a golden age to come, of a period of marvelous triumph on the part of righteousness and holiness over the whole world, that, of course, is indicated by some of these passages and many others which I could have uh, referred to. And what I'm observing in this very second point here is that all Christians believe in some kind of millennium. Usually when we say so-and-so is a millenarian, we usually mean a premillenarian. But that is a little bit of abuse of language. Really, every Christian is a millenarian. That is, he believes in some kind of millennium. He's premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial, but all of these affirm a millennium. They differ in what they understand it to be and when they expect it to come, but they all are millenarian. For one thing, as I say, the term applies in the 20th chapter of Revelation. That's a part of divine revelation, so we know there is such a thing as a millennium because it says that Christ shall reign for a thousand years, we know that Christ is going to reign for a thousand years. How can anybody believe this book and doubt when it says that Christ is going to reign for a thousand years, that Christ is going to reign for a thousand years? You just have to be a millenarian. It's just that we are so focused on the differences of our interpretation that we forget that very obvious thing that these are differences in our interpretation of the millennium, not differences in our acceptance versus rejection of millennium. No, no, no. We all believe in the millennium. Let's not forget that, even as we probe more deeply into the different conceptions of the millennium which we may entertain. Number three, some think this refers to present Christians who enjoy blessedness as they live and reign with Christ now for a thousand years, Revelation 20, verse 4. For these ah millenarians, the whole ideal period is between the first and second comings of the Lord. Here is a view of the people called ah millenarians, ah mills. Right now, the first and second coming equals the millennium. When Revelation 24 says Christ lived and reigned a thousand years, the way Augustine, who 
is a great architect of this particular view because he dominated the Middle Ages. Any other millenarian view, including the premillennialism, which existed rather widely in the early church, faded out. Augustine put an end to that kind of millennialism for a millennium. It wasn't even really discussed seriously, except in very rare occasions, until the Reformation period opened up some other aspects of truth, and later on it became more common. But the Ah Mills are people who believe the millennium is the period before Christ's coming, after Christ's first coming, and before his uh, second coming. It's this whole period. So we're in the millennium right now, according to the Ah Mills. It's ironical, of course, they're called our mills. The our mills means equals no millennium. As a matter of fact, they are quite strong millenarians. Jay Adams, who's one of them, he likes to talk about this as pro-millennialism because he's all for the millennium. This, in his opinion, as an our millennialist, this is what the millennium means. I'm a most enthusiastic our millennialist is what he's saying because I believe the millennium's right here and I'm living in it and enjoying it. And I'm confident it will continue until Jesus Christ comes again. Actually, though, this is an alpha uh, a privative, which means no millennium. It's a misnomer, and you can see why Rogers prefers to, I mean, uh, Adams prefers to call it pro-mill. It's for the millennium in this sense of the word, pan Millennialism, it's sometimes called, meaning that all of this is uh, a millennium. All that's going on now, not just something in the future, but all that's going on now between this whole period of the last days is the millennium. And we've noted time and again the tyranny of language, the oddity of language, the way language is uh, oddly used and so on, and this is one of the oddest to call something no millennialism, which is millennialism with a vengeance, which is millennialism here and now, you don't hear our millennialists getting as excited about it as premillennialists. That's part of the reason. Adams is a bit of an exception that way. He is enthusiastic and excited and pro-millennial and such things as that. But uh, the man who really shaped this thought rather definitively for our century was a great Dutch theologian at Princeton Seminary named Gerhardus Voss. His studies in eschatology were very profound. John Murray considered him the finest exegete, that is, expositor of the Bible in its original languages, especially the Old Testament and its Hebrew, the finest exegete of the 20th century. And much of his profound exegetical studies were on this subject of the last days he shows that the last days are not just the end time of this present era, but the whole era. They were in the last days at Pentecost, and they're going to be in the last days when Jesus Christ comes again. But we're not waiting for the last days. Frost showed we're in the last days. But anyway, that's the first view. The Ah Mills, who believe that the millennialism is between the two comings. And while I'm here, I may as well describe the others, the post-mill view is that a thousand years, I'll put it in quotes, a thousand years, because they don't always insist on that as being a necessarily an exact chronological period. Thousand is often a term for ideal period. And remember, the book of Revelation where the term occurs is a highly apocalyptic and symbolic book. You, you, know, you know full well it can't be taken literally, except at very rare places. Generally speaking, it is full of imagery, and one has to interpret it with great uh, difficulty and caution and so on. But the thousand years there, if it isn't taken literally, is understood to be a long period of great uh, blessing. A thousand years at the end of this era, in which Christianity spreads over and dominates. Now, let's just say for space to say Christianity 
dominates the world. As a prelude to Christ's coming. And Christ's coming is said to be post-millennial because it's after this millennium. This millennium, as some people believe it has started, it's interesting that in the 19th century they tended to be more confident about it. People like Charles Hodge and in the preceding century Jonathan Edwards and uh, Princeton School in general, famous Lorraine Bettner, everybody knows his book on predestination, but he makes it very clear that he thinks God has predestined a glorious time after which Jesus Christ will come. So he's a strong post-millenarian. But post-millenarianism suffered a kind of eclipse the beginning of this century because it was taken over by the social gospelers. You could see how they would do that. These people, beginning with Walter Rauschenbusch, the first part of this century, were determined to see that the gospel would reach all strata of society, that the social implications of the gospel would be felt everywhere, that it wasn't enough just to save souls, one had to permeate the culture. You've heard that in many places, but it was known as a social gospel at the beginning because it wasn't just the gospel spreading itself into society. Many of the people who followed in uh, Rausch and Bush's train, even though they weren't actually uh, as evangelical as Rausch and Bush, really felt that was the gospel. They lost all interest in saving souls. We, many of them became convinced there were no souls to be saved, that God didn't actually damn people, and there wasn't any need to believe to be saved. But in the case of Rausch and Bush, he claimed conversion under D.L. Moody and was a bit of a fundamentalist at the beginning. It was perfectly obvious, though, as he developed his thought, he was moving more and more away from center, and those who followed him a way out, and the social gospel, which they were championing, came to be associated with liberalism. And that's what brought it under a great cloud, and most conservative people developed a deep distaste for it, even though it had been the classical view at Princeton and in New England before that, because it was now seemingly inseparably connected with a view which was fundamentally antithetical to Christianity in the liberal direction. That may have been too severe a criticism at certain points, but that is surely the way it was viewed. But post-millennialism, which, uh, which was strongly advocated, say, in the 19th century, in the 18th century, went into a deep cloud at the beginning of this century, and now appeared in the last 25 years another movement called Theonomy, and Christian Reconstruction, which are very conservative, very reformed in its leaders and so on, who are strong advocates, just as Bettner, who's now in his 80s and so on, is a strong advocate. So anybody who labored under the impression that post-millennialism was a liberal cop-out on the millennial view realized that is not the case that liberals really don't believe in seriously in any of these millennial thinking, but that a true conservative can really be thoroughly convinced and, as Rush Dooney and his other associates in the theonomic movement, they, they themselves got their shoulders to the wheel. They are vigorously moving into politics and economics and law and all phases of the culture, art, in order to have Christ's spirit and teaching prevalent everywhere, and they believe they're ultimately going to succeed, and when the true success comes, it will indeed be a millennium which will precede the coming of Christ. Christ will come after the millennium. Consequently, it's called a post-millennial view. Now, the pre-mill view teaches that this particular era, they somewhat share the Ah Mills view that this era will not uh, essentially change. There'll be a growth of Christians and the church, but there'll also be a growth of anti-Christianity, 
and revelation of the Antichrist and so on, and a great difference between the ah mills, uh, uh, the ah mills and the pre mills, is that the ah mills call this the millennial period. These people feel this is anything but the millennial period, but they do see it as essentially the same as this, and certainly are hostile to any notion that a millennium will occur in this time period between the first and the second coming of Jesus Christ. They think, as a matter of fact, pretty much the way the Ah Mills do, but not <laughs> calling it a millennium, which they think is rather preposterous and so on, that this era will continue to grow as it is, and the deep problems the church has and society has, that will be ameliorated by the gospel and evangelism and so on, will be basically unchanged until the second coming and the millennium actually introduced. It, Christ comes pre or before the millennium, and he establishes this thousand-year period, and most pre-mills are quite literal in interpreting the thousand years as that many periods on the calendar and so on, and many will be converted, and the Christ will rule over all, including those who are hostile, and there will be, under his rod of iron, there will be a period of unsurpassed peace and justice in the world, and also great many souls saved. All of these views anticipate a violent resistance to Christ after the millennium period. The post mills do, the ah mills do, and even the pre mills do. After the millennium has uh, come and gone, there'll be this awesome satanic counterattack which will be destroyed, and then comes the final uh, state. Now, I have to say when I'm talking about premillennialism, and I have been mentioning the classical variety of premillennialism. There has been also in our time, and now a very conspicuous part of it, dispensational premillennialism, which I don't even believe is a valid form of premillennialism, though the dispensationalists consider it to be the only valid form. They've often said to their fellow pre-mills who aren't dispensational, if you are going to be consistent with the doctrine, you are going to be dispensational as well. It's from the dispensationalists that we get this idea of a rapture which precedes the final coming of Christ to this world and establishes a seven-year period. And then also, most abominably, they get the idea that once the millennium is established, a descendant of David or David himself will actually rule on the throne and the temple will be rebuilt and the Old Testament sacrifices will be reestablished. This is the element. I disagree personally with this whole pattern, but at this particular point, my disagreement is vehement. This is an absolutely insufferable idea that during this period, we would restore the original animal sacrifices of the Old Testament. The reason that is virtually blasphemy to me and apostasy is the fact that all of those animal sacrifices were pointing to the Lamb of God. And when He appeared and took away the sin of the world, to which they merely pointed, they were removed. And we don't offer animal sacrifices now. The Jews may have a day of atonement and so on, but that's because they reject Jesus Christ. But anybody who believes in Jesus Christ knows that the day of atonement has come and gone, and animal sacrifices have passed away with it. And for these people who aren't Jews, unless they're Jewish converts, they actually, their fellow conservatives, are very much dedicated to biblical inerrancy and the deity of Christ, the so-called fundamentals of the faith. But here they introduce something that's fundamentally contrary to the faith, that in the millennium, millennial period, actually animal sacrifices will be reestablished. Now, let me remind you once again that the classical premillennial position, which has been represented very effectively until he died recently by George Eldon Ladd, is remonstrating with these dispensationalists, 
in terms of premillennialism, maintaining that the classical view is the sound view, while the dispensational premillennialists are arguing, as I say, the other way. But the classical premillennialist is probably more hostile to the dispensational premillennialists even than these other views because they think it's a perversion or distortion of an essentially sound view. But one cannot talk today about premillennialism without thinking of pre dispensational premillennialism as well because I suspect that this is a minority report, excuse me, majority report among the premillennialists. I mean, I think there are more dispensational premillennialists today than there are classical premillennialists. That would never be true of the historic church. If you survey a couple thousand years of our history, this is a new phenomenon, the new kid in the block, but it has become the predominant form of premillennialism. Well, I personally am not a premillennialist. I have no particular trouble with this. I don't think it's right, but it doesn't threaten any verity of the Christian faith. But this is something else again. But in just presenting the millenniums, one has an accuracy to mention this is on the scene probably the most conspicuous form of premillennialism, so-called. Now, uh, I've sort of uh, gone ahead of myself in a way uh, because once I got started in that little diagram, I finished it out, but let's stay with the written material here for a moment, though I can move rather rapidly, I think, through it. Number four, this is the first resurrection, regeneration, and over the regenerate, the second death, damnation, this is all described in Romans, I mean Revelation 20, over uh, the regenerate, the second death, damnation has no power, for Satan is bound and cannot hurt, though he continually try. Uh, that's the continuing description of that first view there, the amillennial. Number five, ironically, this form of millennialism is called amillennialism, meaning no millennium, when its adherents think it's millennialism in the purity of its conception, as I've explained. Number six, others believe, and here I'm closing in on that post-millennial view, and you'll see this as a summary of what I've been elaborating previously. Six, others believe the millennium will be brought about by the church's mission in all the world, which will someday be made so successful that for a long period before the final evil revolt and end of the world, Christian righteousness will flourish everywhere in the world. It's called post-millennialism because Christ comes post or after this glorious millennial period that, as I say, the present day Christian reconstructionists tend to think has already begun or at least it will be brought about possibly or even probably by this vigorous advocacy of Christianity across the culture and all the world. Certainly they themselves are putting forth Herculean efforts in that area. Number seven, this is called post-millennialism because the second coming will follow after it. Eight, other Christians, now we're down talking about the premillennial view, other Christians believe that good and evil will grow apace through this era, but evil may gain until the second coming when Christ destroys much evil and dominates what remains as he rules with a rod of iron for an unparalleled thousand-year period of perfect peace and justice in this world. Nine, this is called premillennialism because Christ comes before it and brings it about. Now, one thing I ought to say here is that this group, even the general premillennialists and certainly the dispensational premillennialists, uh, really think this is wishful thinking. The postmillenarians imagining that there's going to be coming uh, a glorious transformation of human society through the gospel. They wish them well, hope them success, but don't believe they're going to have it. And one of the premillennialists is famous for the statement. We don't believe in polishing the brass while the ship is going down. Now, what they mean by that is these people are polishing the brass to be concerned with education and politics and culture and scholarship and uh, uh, all phases of art and literature and so on. Good in uh, of itself, but when you consider the ship is going down, people are perishing in hell by the thousands every day, 
That's a luxury you can't afford. Now, this is extreme. Not everybody would say it this vulgarly, shall I say, but there is a definite emphasis on getting out the gospel, reaching people for Jesus Christ. And while they're not hostile to what the Reconstructionists are doing, and some of them are very sympathetic, they think the emphasis is misplaced. Get them saved is the fundamental thing. Uh, if you had the time, polish the brass, but we don't have the time. Now, let me hastily summarize the things that we have in common and that are very positive in millennialism in general. Ten, all Christians are millenarians of one sort or another and have the following convictions in common. One, Christ, whether by His Spirit or by His visible presence in resurrection and glory, alone can bring peace in the world. They're all agreed on that. We close ranks at this point. Christ alone can ultimately bring it about, whether it's by a special outpouring of His Spirit or His actual coming Himself, it is Christ only. Number two, millennialism of any kind assures victory for the church, even in this world, at some time. Many of the post-millenarians write books about victory, and they've certainly got the victory theme, as they believe their efforts will be crowned with success. But whether you share that view or not, the certainty of victory for Jesus Christ is in the heart of every millennialist. Three, all Christians, therefore, are humbly but confidently optimistic. I don't know whether you know about the Optimist Club. I don't know anything about it except that I once spoke to some members of it, being escorted there by a minister friend who was a member of it. And since as I read their mottos and so on, I realized they were resting their optimism on themselves and their general outlook with mankind, on mankind. And in my speech, I said, gentlemen, you have no basis for optimism. You oughtn't even to exist. The only optimism is based on Jesus Christ. And while you may be, may all of you be Christian, you're in a society which is optimistic without presuming Jesus Christ. You should be pessimist of the profoundest character. Outside of Jesus Christ, there is nothing but pessimism. In Christ, there's nothing but optimism. Remember how I said in one of the early lectures about that girl at the conference asking me, what is a tragedy? A tragedy is everything that happens to a non-Christian. It never happens to a Christian because it works. all these things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose, but they work together for ill to those who hate God and are not called according to There's no basis whatever for optimism in this world, but there's nothing but optimism in Christ Jesus, and all of the millenarians recognize that. Five, Christianity is cosmic in scope. It concerns a whole world, not just a part of it. Six, all Christians are necessarily, constantly, happily, eschatologically oriented. We live sub specie aeternitatis in time. That is, we live under the aspect of it. And one of the great advantages of millenarianism is that though you know the eternal future is incomparably more important than these fleeting minutes that we actually live, it's rather easy to forget about that. But thinking in millenarian terms and ways in which affect the world as it now is and the life we now live, you're eschatologically oriented inevitably. See, what I mean is you can forget about the distant eternal future, but you can't forget about it when you are thinking about an imminent millennium of some sort or another. It's not as important as the future state, but it serves a role better than even the future state can, namely, it makes you think about the future state. Seven, Christianity, though profoundly heaven-oriented, is not otherworldly. Eight, where we will be in the eschaton depends on where we are and what we are doing in the here and now. And every millenarian knows that. Nine, Heaven and hell are the ultimate eschaton, to which this is just a pointer, and we must never forget.